Hi, this is Jeff Hoffman. Let's move on to genetics. This chart lists the basic genetic terms that you should be familiar with. Codominance occurs when neither of the two alleles are dominant. An example would be blood types. This means that in patients who are heterozygous, or have one of each type of allele, A and B, each allele has an effect. Variable expression is when individuals who have the same genotype have a different phenotype. For example, two individuals who both have the same mutation in NF1 can have different presentations of neurofibromatosis. Incomplete penetrance is when not all individuals with a certain mutant genotype show any kind of phenotype. This is different from variable expression, since in the case of variable expression, all patients show some type of phenotype. It just varies from one to the next. Pleiotropy is when a genotype can cause multiple different phenotypic effects. For example, patients with phenylketonuria, which is caused by mutation in phenylalanine hydroxylase, can have a few seemingly unrelated phenotypes, such as mental retardation, lighter colored skin or hair, and sometimes even a smaller head size. Imprinting occurs when a disease phenotype depends on whether a mutation was inherited from the patient's mother or father. We'll cover some examples of this soon, such as prater willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome. But basically this can happen because some genes are repressed by heritable epigenetic marks, such as methylation, only in the male or female germline. This may seem like a strange regulatory strategy, but it makes sense if we consider another example, which is that a lot of genes that are regulated by imprinting play a role in growth and development of the fetus. This is because the male and female parents have different priorities. The male parent, from the perspective of evolutionary fitness, wants an offspring that is big and strong, and therefore some genes that are expressed only from the male parent cause the fetus and placenta to become larger. On the other hand, the female has a greater interest in self-preservation, so genes that are expressed in the fetus only from maternal chromosomes often act to reduce the size of the fetus and invasiveness of the placenta. Anticipation is the process by which the severity of a disease worsens or the age of onset of the disease is earlier in succeeding generations. In other words, if your maternal grandfather has a mild disease and then your mother has a moderate version of that disease, you would have the most severe version. An example of this is Huntington's disease, which we'll talk about more later. Loss of heterozygosity implies that if a patient inherits or develops a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, the complementary allele must also be deleted or mutated before this will permit a neoplastic transformation, since only one functional copy is needed to prevent this. This is also known as the two-hit hypothesis, and some examples of genes that fit this are retinoblastoma and p53. This is not the same thing as oncogenes, which only require one mutant allele for cancer to develop, since they have a gain-of-function mutation. A dominant negative mutation is one that prevents normal function of the gene, but has a dominant effect. So even if only one allele has a dominant negative mutation, its protein product will prevent the protein product of the wild-type allele from functioning. This can occur with some transcription factors, where a mutated non-functional transcription factor can still bind to DNA, but has lost its ability to regulate transcription. However, it blocks the normal copy from binding as well. Linkage disequilibrium is a tendency for alleles at two linked loci to be inherited together more often than you'd expect by chance. This is a statistical term referring to a population, not to a family or an individual. So what do I mean by linked loci? This means that the loci, or genes, are in the same chromosome. For example, let's say you have two genes, A and B, and each gene has two alleles, the capital and the lowercase one. If both alleles of both genes have been around for many generations, and neither confers a selective advantage, you should see equal amounts of each allele of each gene. Also, you expect to see big A's and big B's mixed together evenly with little A's and little B's, so you'd have a 25% chance of getting each type of combination. Now, linkage disequilibrium is when these ratios are not all the same. For example, maybe almost everybody who has a big A will also have a big B, and almost none of them will have a little B. The most common reason for this is if one of the alleles was recently introduced to the population, in which case it will be inherited more commonly with the other genes that came with it. So going back to our example, if your population only had big A's and little A's and big B's to begin with, and there were no little B's yet, but then a mutation occurred in the B gene which allowed little B's to occur, and that mutation happened on a chromosome that had a big A on it, almost all of your little B's will appear with big A's, and you won't see almost any of these. However, over time, due to recombination between the loci, the ratios will balance out and they'll all be 25%. Mosaicism occurs when some cells in the body have a different genetic makeup than others. This can only be caused by events that occur after fertilization, since anything that happened earlier would have the same effect on all cells of the developing embryo. The classic example of mosaicism is called lionization, which is when all cells in the female embryo inactivate one of their X chromosomes, chosen at random, which means that about half of the female cells express genes from their father's X, and the other half express genes from their mother's X. Mosaicism can also be caused by mutations that occurred during embryogenesis. For example, if a patient would have an AB blood type, but a deletion of the A gene occurs in cells that give rise to half the hematopoietic system, then half the patient's blood cells will be AB, and the other half will just be type A. A third way mosaicism can happen is if two zygotes form, which would have ended up as dizygotic twins, except they fused together very early in embryogenesis.
Now half of the cells will have the genotype that one twin would have had, and the other half of the cells have the genotype that the other twin would have had. A different type of mosaicism is germline mosaicism, which is when a mutation occurs that only affects cells that will give rise to the germline. This will have no effect on that individual, but it will affect their offspring. Locus heterogeneity is when mutations at different loci or in different genes produce the same phenotype. This can occur if two genes have the same function, or if they're in the same pathway. For example, Marfan syndrome, MEN2B, and homocystinuria can all result in a Marfanoid habitus, which means the patient is tall and thin, with long, thin fingers, and joint hypermobility. There are also several genetic mutations that can all cause albinism, such as in genes responsible for production of melanin and genes involved in transport of melanin from melanocytes to keratinocytes. Heteroplasmy is when two different versions of mitochondrial DNA both exist in the same cell. Since you only inherit mitochondria from one parent, your mother, this occurs due to new mutations rather than inheritance from different genotypes. A mutation in mitochondrial DNA can propagate, resulting in some mitochondria having the mutated form and others having the normal form, and both can be passed on to new cells during division, which is especially important if it happens either in the egg or soon after fertilization, since more cells can potentially inherit the mutant DNA. This can result in variable expression of an inherited mitochondrial disease, depending on how many cells get how much of the mutant DNA. Our last genetic term is uniparental disomy, which occurs when an offspring receives two copies of a chromosome from one parent and no copies from the other parent. This can sometimes look like in printing, since again you're only receiving expressible genes from one parent. These equations are used to describe the frequencies with which alleles of a gene occur in a population. Here we use P and Q to refer to the two alleles in the same way that I used big A and little a earlier. So what does Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium mean? Basically, just that the ratio of P to Q does not change over time. In order for this to be the case, four conditions have to be true. No new mutations can occur. Neither P nor Q confers a selective advantage over the other. Mating is random and not affected by genotype, and no individuals leave or enter the population. If all these are met, then the ratio of P to Q does not change over time, or in other words, they're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So why is this important? Well, it allows you to do some simple calculations to learn about the prevalence of individuals with a disease or carriers of the disease, if you know the allele frequencies. We'll start with the basics. P plus Q equals 1, since we're assuming that P and Q are the only alleles of this gene. For example, if 40% of the alleles are P, then 60% have to be Q for the total to equal 1. If P is 10%, then what's Q? Right, 90%. Okay, so how about this other equation? P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Let's break it down. P squared and Q squared are the proportions that are homozygous for the P and Q alleles. So if P equals 50%, or 0.5, then P squared is 0.25, which means that 25% of the individuals in the population are homozygous for P. As another example, if P is 0.1, which means that 10% of the alleles are P, and 90% are Qs, then what percent of individuals would be P squared, or homozygous for P? That'd be 0.01, or 1% of the population. 2PQ is the frequency of heterozygotes. Since individuals can only be homozygous for P, homozygous for Q, or heterozygous, and have one allele of each, the sum of these three groups makes up the entire population, or 1. Okay, so let's do an example of something you might see on the exam. Let's say 1% of individuals in a population have an autosomal recessive disease, and you have to figure out what percent of the alleles in this population are not mutant. This means that 1% of individuals are homozygous for the mutant allele. We can assign P to be the mutant allele, and Q to be the normal allele. So what does P squared equal? Right, 1%, since P squared is the proportion of individuals which are homozygous for P, which in the case of an autosomal recessive disease are the ones who have the disease. You can solve this for P by taking the square root of each side, which leaves you with P equals 0.1. Now the question is asking us for what percent of alleles are not mutant, which in this case is just Q. So we can solve for Q by plugging in P equals 0.1, which we got earlier, to our equation P plus Q equals 1. Q comes out to be 0.9, which is the answer to our question. Okay, as promised, we'll return to imprinting. Do you remember what that means? It's when a gene's expression, and therefore the phenotype it produces, depends on which parent it was inherited from. This can be caused by methylation of the gene's promoter in one parent's germline. For example, let's say in one person, the allele from one parent is imprinted, and the allele from the other parent is expressed. In the germline, these old imprints are erased, leaving a blank slate. Then, depending on the sex of the individual, new imprints are made. So in this example, the gene can be expressed in chromosomes coming from the mother, but not in chromosomes coming from the father. Now let's say this gene has a mutation on it here. The mother will not be affected, since this copy is imprinted anyway, and she has another copy which can be expressed. However, if her offspring ends up with that copy, they're in trouble, since the only other copy they get is from the imprinted version from their father. This is the case in Angelman syndrome, in which the maternal allele is deleted or mutated, and the father's allele is normal but imprinted. Patients with Angelman's will have mental retardation, seizures, 
ataxia, and inappropriate laughter, and the combination of these has led to its nickname of happy puppet. Prater Willis syndrome is similar, but is due to a deletion or mutation of the normally active paternal allele and an imprinted maternal allele. This causes mental retardation, hyperphagia, obesity, hypogonadism, and hypotonia. The genes that cause both of these are located on chromosome 15. These syndromes can also be caused by uniparental disomy, as I mentioned earlier, because if a gene is imprinted by one parent and the offspring receives both alleles from that parent, then they won't have a copy of the gene that they can express.